All right, guys, I think we're live. Uh, welcome to another week of the Educated Home Buyer Live. This is where Josh and myself answer your mortgage and real estate related questions, update you on the economy to help you become educated home buyers. Uh, this week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I think we're going to be going live on Instagram as well um, with our software. So if you're watching on us, watching us on Instagram for the first time, um, Congratulations. Uh, this is an advancement in technology, Josh. Jeb, I did the vetted VA live last night and we had uh, a VA loan expert, a girl that was on there and she has like 100,000 subscribers on TikTok. So she was very excited to try to stream it to TikTok. It's a little complex through StreamYard, but she got it figured out and she was very happy that we had a thousand viewers and says, well, cool. Can you see the cumulative view time? And she looks up and she goes, yeah, the average view time is 14 seconds and my subscribers stay for a minute and four seconds. I go, I don't think they were really getting the gist of our show while uh, while they were there for 14 seconds. Well, well, that and the fact that Instagram puts us side by side versus one on top of each other. So the, the format's going to suck, but... If anybody wants to watch it, it's there. If you're watching it on Instagram now and you want to watch it live on another platform, you can do you can go over to YouTube and, and catch us there. But um, anyway, Jeb, Josh, Jeb, yep. importantly, my wife confirmed you are there. She is watching it. On well, Instagram. there you go. That's that's what we needed to know from our biggest fan. Uh, so this past week, Josh, not a lot of updates. Wow. My my lighting just went out when I clapped my hands. Uh, you not a lot for your, for your, for your lights. Not a lot happened, uh, this past week with regards to economic data. Uh, we did have a couple fed members come out and just say different things, um, about, you know, the recent decline in inflation and rate cuts and all of that, which was to be expected after last week. Uh, but we have seen again, noticeable improvement in the 10 year and mortgage rates have continued to decline. So I know we're going to talk a little bit about this as we start diving into some charts here in a moment, Josh, but anything on the mortgage rate front that we want to talk about or get out of the way before we dive into them? No, we'll just get to it when we get to the charts. In addition to it being the most wonderful time of the year, it is the most quietest time of the year other than late summer because uh, all bond traders have gone home for Christmas. So we're just uh, watching paint dry every day. Well, that and with that, Josh, I think it's important to know it's easier to move markets, right? When there's less traders out there trading, um, in this case, bonds, right? So less traders can actually have a bigger impact on on the movement um, without news that we would normally expect to, to have happen. So and, and that's probably part of it. Um, so but it, it is a light week. Friday's a, a half day in, in the in the bond market. So tomorrow with jobless claims and um, will probably be the biggest biggest day of the week. And from there, we'll kind of have a better direction of where rates go. Probably, uh, Jeb, the, the biggest advice is tell people don't pay much attention to anything because it can be volatile, good or bad, until we get back to the first couple trading days of the year. That's when we're going to see what the market really thinks of this rally. Does it continue? Does it give some of it back? Because we're not really going to see that until uh, traders get back in full at the first of the year. All right, good stuff. So if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, make sure you put in questions that you have about the process. We'll definitely get into those as we go through the charts here and actually look at what's happening with inventory, the economy, all of that good stuff. So Josh, as we always do, we start with inventory. So inventory declined again this past week. We're now sitting at 539,000 active listings on the market here in the United States. Um, as you can see from this chart here, you know, we're just above 2022 uh, 22 levels. Um, but if you kind of look up, you know, the, the bottom four, there, the colored uh, colors on the bottom are everything since the pandemic, um, the craziness. And then you go up and you look at the top and those were more cyclical markets. Those were more normal markets. And you can kind of see the ebbs and flows, how those all look the same. And then you can kind of go down to the bottom where we are now and just see all the volatility in the market. Uh, but with that, we've reached the peak in inventory for this year. Orange County currently sitting at 1,928 homes. Huntington Beach at 167. So again, both those numbers are declining. We're going to continue that decline uh, for the next week, two weeks, uh, which is where we'll hit the lowest levels of the year. Um, you know, but not anywhere close to where we were last year. I think last year we started the year January 1st at 967 homes, which was the lowest ever on record. This year we're not going to be that low, but in our conversation today with Stephen Thomas from Reports on Housing. Um, which is going to come out in a podcast here really soon. He did mention that this is going to be the second lowest we've ever started 
a year um, with regards to inventory. So it's going to be interesting. Um, Josh, this is again, the same chart, just going back a little bit further as we always do. Um, new listings. So new listings uh, this past week, 39,613. You can see it from this chart here. We're continuing that decline um, and we're going to for the next couple of weeks. Uh, last year, this time, we had about 34,000 listings coming to the market. The year before, 39. So we were about where we were in 2021. So why more listings this year than last year? Hard to say. Um, is it is it rates moving a little bit lower? You have a little bit of pop in inventory? Maybe. Um, maybe there's just people looking to to do something different this year. It's 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 really hard to say. But either way, the numbers are very, very low on a historic metric. And then weekly, we went from 546 to 538. Uh, our peak this year was at 569,000 homes. The low for inventory was back in 2022, where we set at 240,000. So we're quite a bit above that. We're still below where the peak where we were last year, and we're above where we were this time last year. So that's good as far as an inventory thing goes, because it, it, it seems to be trending a little bit higher, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, this just shows that new contracts pending from the year prior were up 7.7%. Again, Josh, is it, you know, lower rates leading to a little bit more activity in the market? Is it just, you know, sellers finding the right property? Hard to say why, you know, things are going under contract now while we're seeing that little pop. Well, look, you're you're seeing a chart here saying it. We talked to Stephen Thomas, who pulls data from the MLS. He's seeing it. This guy right here, I've been telling you, um, both the quantity and the quality of conversations that I'm having is, is going up, which is atypical for the middle of December. So I it would be naive to think that the big increase in affordability due to lower interest rates hasn't sort of spiked the market here in the last couple of weeks of the year. No, exactly. Um, so it, it's, you know, and I, I, I will reference the podcast here in just a moment after we dive through these charts, but we just did two really, really good podcasts that are going to come out in the next two weeks over the next two weeks are going to talk a lot about the market and and where we're headed um median home price continues declining which is normal for this time of year it's currently sitting at four hundred and twenty thousand. the median price of new listings coming to the market currently sitting at 370 as you can see there's always this ebb and flow to the to the market and this time of year is typically when we start to see that lower you know, uh, listing price, that lower median home price, and then it starts to change as we move into the new year. Um, price drops, again, even with interest rates being high, um, you know, less demand out there in the market, we're still 4% lower than we were this time last year, uh, sitting at 39% versus 43% on price reductions. And then this is the same chart. I just like the view of it because it kind of gives you a better idea of where we were previously, where we are now color coded uh but essentially just shows you we're currently introduction and this is typically the time in the year where we see that peak from here we should see less and less price reductions as we start to move into that spring market and josh the big news again is the 10 year right currently sitting today i think we're at 3.8 something um if i don't if i remember correctly i think this time last week we were somewhere around 38 as well so we were pretty close to where we are today right I got a chart that tells you all that. No, last oh. week we closed. We closed at 403 and closed okay. today at, there we go. at 388. So 15 basis points of improvement, which doesn't sound like a huge amount, but it is a huge amount in light of the big improvement that came before it. No, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, existing home sales uh, was somewhat of a surprise. Uh, we were trending at what? 3.77 million seasonally adjusted. And today we got news that it was at what? 3.82 uh, million. So, you know, I, I don't think that was expected to, to see a, a, a pop of, of 0.8% in month over month existing home sales. Josh, any, any thoughts on that? It's, it's a tiny move, but everything's relative. You have to look at these, those homes that, that closed in November were put under contract in September and October, which was literally the highest rates in the last 20 something years. So we would have expected that uh, sales volume was low and was going to trend even a little bit lower, even though we're near the floor. So seeing some strength before the big improvement in interest rates gives us reason to think that when we look forward to January, when we see December data, and more importantly, February, when we see January data, when those lower rates really impact in there, mm -hmm. we're going to see something like we saw last year that was a very strong first quarter of the year. 
Yeah, and it's important to note. I mean, you mentioned that, Josh, but you didn't like go into detail there. The numbers that you're looking at here are for contracts that went under contract two, three months ago, right? Um, when rates were higher. So the the the, the six and a half percent rates or whatever you're being quoted out there in the market right now, that's not going to reflect until you know probably February, um, you know January at the earliest in in, in a lot of these reports that are that are going to be coming out. Uh, what's our next one here, Josh? New construction. So we had housing starts up. Um, and yeah, go ahead. The, the interesting thing about this one, Jeb, is multifamily starts. So we're sitting here saying, hey, we have a lack of homes for first time home buyers, home buyers in general to buy, and builders are out there on a rampage building multifamily. This is not unexpected when you look at the underlying causes. With a multifamily property, someone, an end investor, needs to have that pencil. And with higher interest rates, and they don't get the benefit of 30-year fixed rates, there's some type of shorter-term financing, less interest in building multifamily when that was the big thing the last few years. So builders are shifting. We're seeing an increase in single-family permits. So from that perspective, we have to look and say, or more so in the starts, you can see 14% up in the starts, uh, down month over month, but up 4% year over year in the permits for single-family. And when we look at that, it's saying that builders are increasingly confident uh, about where we are going forward. A year ago, they were kind of not shaken, This. We're going to bring as little to market as possible, make sure we can sell it and, and maintain our prices and margins. It's telling you that they are looking forward and reading the tea leaves and thinking we're going to have a stronger market next year. Doesn't mean a crazy market, doesn't mean the world's greatest market, but stronger than what we saw for the last 18 months or so. No, and we're going to talk about that more here in just a minute. So, Josh, this is uh, the wage growth looking across, you know, um, internationally. Uh, what are we seeing in this chart? financial countries are around the world. And this is real wage growth. So whenever we talk about real interest rates, real wage growth, this is adjusted for inflation. And I believe this goes back to Q3 of 2019. So over the last four years in the United States, wages have gone up after inflation, after this period of, of really high inflation, 2.8%. Only Canada can say that they've had positive over the same time frame. France, Japan, UK, Germany, Italy, those people are making less money after inflation. So it's important to, to remember it's been a weird market. It's been a difficult market, a difficult economy. We see, oh, the economy is doing great. The market's doing great. Housing went way up, but then people are saying inflation's too high. Can't pay my bills. It only matters in terms of how it feels to you, but across the broad spectrum of everyone in the country, we have done better than most major industrialized nations over the last four years. No, uh, yeah, it's all, it's, it's all relative, right? It's always how it impacts you personally. Uh, um, the feds dot plot, uh, what well, showing rate, rate cuts ahead got Josh. So there's, you know, there's different views at the moment. Some, you know, depending on who you look at online, three, three rate cuts, six rate cuts. This is more of what the feds actually see. And this is just an, another way of looking at the same data that we looked at. It's actually simplified and easier to understand. So if we're at uh, five and a half, we see five fed members think we're going to be a half percent lower. Six think we're going to be three quarters of a percent lower or think we're going to be a full percent. So really, we've got an outlier that thinks we're going to be a percent and a half lower. We have two that think nothing is going to change. But it tells you that about 80% of the voting Fed members are seeing three to five cuts next year. What I thought was sort of just to trigger the conversation in terms of throwing this slide in, because we basically covered this data last week. But what did we see this week? We see every Fed member out there talking to the media saying, oh, the market's way ahead of us. We haven't even talked about rate cuts. Why would we cut rates? Well, Powell himself said why in the press conference. Markets are not dumb. They're not hallucinating things that are being said. He literally in the press conference said that if inflation is coming down and we do not reduce rates, real rates are getting higher and more restrictive. So by not cutting, they are getting more restrictive by just standing still. It's not an option unless somehow magically the economy gets even stronger next year, which every sign is pointing to a slightly to significantly weakening economy at some point next year. No, and, and you know, we talk about this a lot, um, but let, let's explain the restrictive stance there, what, what the Fed means by that, right? Where inflation is versus where the Fed funds rate is. 
that difference and what that means when there is such a large difference between those two numbers. So per, for two years during the pandemic, when the Fed funds rate was at zero, zero, we have inflation somewhere one and a half to two and a half percent anywhere in that time frame. You have negative real rates. So it's a disincentive for savers. There's there's nowhere to get yield anywhere. So it's spend your money, invest your money, because saving it does nothing positive. Now we're over to the opposite side, that if the economy is slowing, you lower rates to incentivize spending to spur the economy. So when we have negative 2% rates, now if we're at three and a quarter and we have a five and a quarter Fed funds rate, we're at negative 2%. If we get halfway home to 2% next year, so you're at two and a half to two and three quarters, if they don't cut, we're gonna have real rates, two and a half, two and three quarters uh, percent real interest rates after we account for inflation. And it overly incentivizes saving when you need investment and spending to spur the economy. They are not going to sit on their hands next year. The only question is how many and how deep are the cuts that they are going to make. All right, good stuff. And this is a look uh, kind of at inflation using true inflation um, showing us what, Josh? So this is a, a, a third party that compiles data and it's more real-time data, but it has a 0.97% correlation to CPI figures going forward. So they're down to 2.79. We've been even lower in the last year. So you don't want to necessarily look at what is the number today. It's what is that trend? That trend is going down and still going down. The deceleration in inflation is slowing because we're getting nearer that low bound at 0%. Not saying that we're going to go back there, but we are going to be in the next six to 12 months really close to the Fed's 2%. The thing that I think is important that everyone remember, prior to the pandemic, the conversation the Fed was having is mm -hmm. how do we spur activity to get inflation up to 2%? So we had a brief period of time where we had massive disruptions to supply chains and massive airdropping of money into the economy. And we saw this inflation and now we go, now this is going to be sticky. It's going to stick with us forever. Something massively structurally changed. And you're like, no, dummies. For 40 years, we couldn't spur inflation if we wanted to. Now you think that uh, a year and a half of overstimulating and, and shut down supply chains is going to change something? If we go forward three to five years, I think we're going to be having the same conversation that we were pre-pandemic, which is how do we get inflation up to 2%? How do we get more growth in the economy? All right, good stuff. This one, Jeb, I put in for your fans who, whenever we talk about inflation moderating, want to pop up and say, inflation is not moderating. I'm still paying way too much for everything. So this shows from 2020 uh, through 2023, the aggregate uh, inflation. So up, prices up in general, compounded inflation since January of 2020 of 22.63%. We don't think of it in those terms, Jeb. How often have we talked about it in total inflation? We talk about it in terms of home prices. We have home prices, where, depending on where you're at, are up 30 to 40%. Prices for everything across the board up 22%. And meaning, if you did not get a raise in the last three years, if you made $50,000 three years ago, you make $50,000 today, you lost 22% of your buying power. Um, so it just, I thought that was an interesting look. And then to give you guys a real number and to let you know that Jeb and I are also impacted by these things. Jeb bitched about buying tires about two months ago. And I had to call him from the tire shop the other day and do the exact same thing. So the last time I bought tires for my truck in May of 2020, they were $325 each. Now, December of 2023, what are we talking 30 months or 20, 36, 42 months later, 39% inflation. I had to pay $451 per tire. That is absurd. So you're not alone. Everyone has their own little thing. We talked about my trip to uh, five guys being $30. Now we talk about $2,000 worth of tires that were $1,300, $1,400 just a, a few years ago. So it, it is everywhere. And what I would say, Jeb, anytime you have a short burst of outpaced returns in anything, stock market goes up, home prices go up, inflation goes up, you would expect that you would see a period of lower levels. I, I think that businesses, as the economy cools, are going to be losing their, their pricing power, and we're going to have a protracted period of, of relatively flat prices. This one here, Jeb, we already talked about that big run down from up at 5%. I believe it was October 19th. Intraday, we went over 5%. Uh, we were at 4032 last week, 3882 this week. Everyone likes to know the numbers. The numbers are highly dependent on you, your situation, your down payment, your credit, where you're buying, what you're buying, price point, 
all of those fun things. But Optimal Blue and Mortgage News Daily are the two best and most accurate sources for general pricing information. So Optimal Blue is showing 6.676, uh, Mortgage News Daily 6.64. So we're within about an eighth of each other. And then on the FHA, six and a half and Mortgage News Daily has it at 6.1. Mortgage News Daily is probably closer to accurate. Um, if I were to look at these, Jeb, to me, Optimal Blue always trends a little bit high because they are heavily um, direct lender independent mortgage bank related, and they tend to have the highest cost, highest rates, highest fees. So those are not bad rates. They are good rates. But uh, for me, I would look at both of them. And if you're anywhere in the range between those two, you're probably getting uh, a decent term. All right. Good stuff. Is that our last chart? I think that's it. That's all that's we it. got. That's all she wrote. All right. Um, so with that, guys, I mentioned earlier uh, two two different podcasts we did this week. So uh, if you guys don't know, so we have a podcast called The Educated Home Buyer. Uh, has a YouTube channel. It has audio on Spotify, Apple, all those good places. Uh, that's where we do a deep dive into mortgage real estate related topics. Over the last month or so, we've interviewed Barry Habib. We've talked to uh, Matt Graham from MBS Live. Uh, yesterday we talked to Logan Manashami from housing wire today. We talked to Steven Thomas from reports on housing here in orange County. Uh, the interview with Logan is going to go next Tuesday, kind of gives us uh, a housing forecast nationwide. And then that'll be published on Tuesday. Uh, it'll be on the YouTube channel as well as the podcast. And then the following week is when Steven Thomas with reports on housing is going to be coming out. He's going to be talking about California more specifically, uh, Southern California is, so if you're here locally, you're going to want to pay attention to that. Uh, but he also talks nationwide as well. So that's going to be a really, really good episode. Deep dive. This is four different people we've talked to, uh, that we have no relation to at all, giving their opinions of the housing market. They're talking prices. They're talking rates. They're talking number of transactions today. We got in, in into detail about how competitive it, it's likely or or not likely to be here going forward. Um, interesting conversations, nonetheless. Josh, what are your thoughts? They're really good conversations. And what I, I just always chuckle and laugh when people will stop by the comments section without watching a video, not hearing a nuanced discussion, and will say, don't listen to these guys. They're realtors. They're mortgage people. My business, my livelihood depends on knowing what's going to happen next, both so I can know what volume is likely to look like, what type of products people are going to need, and how many of those people are going to come through. So what we are doing with these experts, these are the people that over not a year or two, um, over 15, 20, 25 years, I first got, uh, it was in a, a class with Barry Habib over 20 years ago. I have been yeah. subscribed to Stephen Thomas for almost 10 years now, close to it. Um, Logan is someone that we follow and have pre since pre-pandemic, so four or five years. All of these people are people that we rely on and trust. They have different data sets. They have different backgrounds. Um, one of the things that I love to say, Jeb, we are all biased. I'm biased. Jeb's biased. You at home are biased. The lunatics that keep ranting on uh, about a crash coming are biased. They're biased towards their wallets because they don't even believe that the housing market is going to crash the way they do. But the best thing you can do to combat your bias is to listen to multiple different perspectives, hear the data they're analyzing, what they believe, and more importantly, why they believe it. And if you like, that doesn't hit me right. I don't agree with that. Start digging into their data sources and, and go from there. The most important thing that we want everyone to leave this show with is the fact that you should buy when it's the right time in your life, never for because of FOMO, never because someone pushing you into it, and only when you believe it's right. Um, I, there's an internet entrepreneur that one of his sayings is, if it isn't hell yes, it's a hell no. So if you haven't got yourself to hell yes, I want to buy a house, you're not there yet. So keep doing your research and wait until that time is right. All right. Good stuff, guys. So, you know, and, and last thing I'll say about that is you guys are always asking us, who do you read? Who do you pay attention to? These people, right? That's why we've been talking about housing, doing what it's been doing for the better part of three years and been pretty accurate with it um, because we're listening to the people that we're trying to, you know, introduce you guys to. So next week, check it out. And if you're interested in this past week's episode, the War on Home Ownership, go check that out as well. But with enough there, Josh, uh, going down uh, the rabbit's hole, let's take some questions here and dive into it. So um, S. Smith comes in with a question, says, do we have any suggestions when working with a realtor long distance? We're about 530 miles away from where we want to purchase. So um, 
I believe you reached out to me, right? Uh, and I think I referred you to someone um, in Reno, if I if I remember correctly. I, as I always say, start with a referral. Start with someone you trust that can refer you to somebody that they trust. If you know someone in that market, then use that person to get you to a trusted professional there. And if you don't, find somebody that knows a lot of trusted professionals like myself. And I'm happy to refer you to somebody that does business the way that I would want to do business with if I were buying a house myself. Uh, but outside of that, that's all you can do, right? Read their reviews online, do your research, well, try to find, you know. Jim, hold, hold on for a second. This happens all the time. You and I read questions differently. I think he did that, reach out to you. And I think the question here is, do you have suggestions when working with a realtor? Like oh, this? okay. How, do, yeah, yeah. how does that change things? If you have a buyer, you've had buyers from the Bay Area yeah. buying here in Huntington. What? Did, how does that change the process? How do you help people when they're not here and you can't just drop everything and go see a house when it gets listed? Uh, I mean, you just gotta, you gotta be, I mean, your, your agent's gotta be, uh, diligent and, uh, informed on the areas that you're looking in. They gotta be able to explain things in a way that you feel comfortable being at it from a distance, but I've sold a lot of properties, uh, from a distance without clients ever seeing them until they walked into it to, to begin with. And one of those is, you know, doing v video tours, but also being like, I like to think I'm detail oriented in the in in the way that I explain things during the process and walking somebody somebody through a home. I nitpick a lot of things. Like I'll walk somebody through a property and I I point out a lot of things. Um, and I I usually ask before I do it, hey, are, are you comfortable with me doing this? Because what I don't want is you to end up buying a house and then you get in there and you're like, I didn't notice any of this stuff. I was too, you know. Um, not worried. I was too excited about the process in general and kind of just overlooked all of these, these minor details. Well, that's my job as the real estate agent is to go through all these minor details, to notice the things that you might not notice. Um, and, and to point them out to you, the things that I would be thinking about if I were a buyer of that home, that's what you want in an agent. If your agent's always, you know, yes, this is the one. Yes, this is the perfect property. Yes. Uh, and never says anything negative about the property. I don't know that that's the right agent. Now, some people probably want that, but I want somebody that's that's real and somebody that's going to say, hey, you know, did you think about this? You know, hey, the property backs to a major street. If you go to resell it, that's going to be a problem. Like if people aren't pointing out the obvious things, then I think that's that's a bigger problem. But we can dive into the question in more detail if you want to reach out to me directly and we can have a conversation off air. Otherwise, you know, we're just kind of taking up the show here with it. But I think every you know, time I every time I see S Smith, I think it's Steve Smith, the former Atlanta Pacer, Portland Trailblazer. I'm like, this is great that we have famous viewers that ask us questions. Oh, well, you know, it could be. Could be. Um, you never know. Uh, let's say uh well, here, Jeb, let's let's yep. look at this. Willing did yep. close on the home on December 8th. The family right. helped right. move things and then claims themselves to be an educated home buyer. Um, so congratulations, Willing. Uh, appreciate you being here. Appreciate you asking questions. Appreciate you bombing our other live streams and asking crazy questions when people don't necessarily know you and think that well, I have a lunatic stalker. But I appreciate it. I like it. It makes me feel important. Uh, question. Follow-up question here. If you buy a personal residence, is there a minimum time frame you must occupy as a personal residence, primary residence? For example, could you convert to a rental at any time? Also, can you do a rate and term refinance anytime? 12 months season loans only for cash out. That is and correct. here's what I will say before you answer that. An educated home buyer would know this, Willie. Just I'm just <laughs> saying. I'm just saying. I believe just, I believe they may have already asked. This we've answered before. this question <laughs> about a, a thousand times. So uh, just so we're clear. You, but anyway, when when you close on a primary residence, you are signing an occupancy affidavit a affidavit that says you intend to occupy the property as your primary residence within 60 days. Nothing else in there. It doesn't say I'm going to be there for 20 years, or I'm going to be there for two years. It says you are going to move in and intend to use it as your primary residence. We know that things can and do change. I've had clients as recent as like, or as quickly as like three months after the fact, two months after the fact, we did another owner occupied purchase for. So it, it requires an explanation of the situation. In terms of cash out, uh, cash out does require seasoning uh, to use the new value. 
If you've taken cash out, you can't do it again within 12 months uh, per Fannie Freddie guidelines. And then in terms of refi anytime, yes, we talked about this in Jeb's situation. His lender doesn't have, isn't subject to an early payoff penalty because they're a bank and make the loan from their own funds. So he refinanced four weeks after closing on his. So the thing to remember is your mortgage originator is going to have an early payoff penalty if you do that within 180 days. So at least talk to them, give them the opportunity. We've seen a crazy move here. There are people reaching out. I have several buyers that are lined up that bought in September, October that we went through it. I said, I'm going to cover you. We're going to watch it. This is your worst case. I will make sure that today is your worst case. Let's hold off. We'll close the thing on day 181. So it wasn't really the question, but we answered that one anyways. All right. Good, good stuff. Um, let's see here. We got a, a couple questions around the same type of thing, Josh. Uh, let's, you know, let's kind of go. I mean, we got Joyce asking mortgage percentage rates next year. So we we've kind of talked we've talked about this in in every every episode going back for the the last couple of years of of, of where rates are where we see them. Uh, but I, I would say based on the four people that we've talked about talked to so far, economist wise, um, what what do we th what are we saying the average is, Josh? If we averaged all four of them together, high fives, uh, high fives. High fives would be average, but most all of them that agree that it's going to depend on when or if, when, and how much the economy rolls over. And if we hit the 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 high end of weakness, and we're not even talking a recession, but we get down to very low growth, less than 0.5% growth next year, they see rates getting into the high fours, low fives. And, and most people don't want to accept that. Like we see it, whether it's in the popular press or just in the comment section on our videos, you guys are nuts. Rates are never getting back to the fours again. There's a very simple and easy path to it. And if you want to hear that, each of them explains what that path is and how it is possible. Not probable. They're not calling for it. Like you said, Jeb, probably mid to high fives is, is what most of them are expecting. And that's not even that big of a move. It's a huge move from where we were in October at 8%, not a huge move from six and a half. So just just, just remember, we had two, three months that were an aberration up there above 7%. And we had a couple of years that were an aberration below 4%. You know, the reality is if we look forward the next five years or so, I would say the preponderance of days, we will be looking at a rate somewhere between four on the low end and six on the high end. So we're still at high and elevated rates relative to where I think we will settle in when inflation normalizes and we see low GDP like we were looking at for the 10 years prior to COVID. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it, where rates are right now, um, if if the economy continues to do what it it's done over the last couple of months, right? So we've we've talked about how January CPI, uh, month over month number. So J January, February, and April of next year ac account for 1.3% of our current 3.1% of, of inflation. So if those three numbers drop and are a point one, right, which is not crazy based off the last couple of reports, then you then that's you're replacing a a, a one point three with a point three, which means that your inflation goes from three point one to two point one by April. Now, if that 90, happens, 90 days, a hundred days, yeah. And so if that happens, I think there's a really high likelihood that you could see a five handle on rates in in the early part of the second quarter. So to think rates you know, can go a lot lower, you need, you need economic, not turmoil, but you need bad things to happen in the economy, in, in data, in order to see, you know, significant, big, significant moves, right? I mean, I think the fives are kind of baked into the cake at this point, assuming just based on where data is at the moment, in order to see something lower than that, I think you need bigger moves in the economy, personally. And you're talking about, Jeb, you're talking about conventional loans, FHA right. and VA are about a half percent lower. We're, we're able to lock clients in well-qualified government buyers, FHA and VA, if they're willing to pay a little bit for it, can get, I'm not suggesting they do it, but 5875, 599 is a reasonable rate without having to pay a ton for it on government loans right now. So the thing that always makes me chuckle, we get um, armchair experts commenting all the time that will say rates are never going to go there. Okay, well, what goes into rates? What is, what is the reason and the rationale for why rates are what they are? How does GDP play into that? How does the level of inflation inflation play into that? Why are spreads elevated right now? And what would cause them to stay elevated? What would cause them to moderate? And you ask people and they go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I just like bashing the keyboard and telling people I know what's going to happen next. 
Uh, like, 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 like keyboard cat. They just hit the hit the thing and they don't know what noise is going to come out. Uh, it's too funny. Uh, Pulse Powered says hearing chatter of a, of a reverse market crash. Will this be good for homeowners? So there's this terminology going around YouTube calling for a reverse housing crash. I actually think it's I'm, glad, I'm glad you know what it is because I was like, with, what, uh, what is this? With Graham Stephan uh, on one of his videos started using the, the terminology instead of housing crash, it's a reverse housing crash. So I'm assuming it basically means that prices are going the opposite direction of, of rather than crashing, Josh. So it, prices going up isn't necessarily good for homeowners. It is good for homeowners. Don't get me wrong. Prices appreciating is good for homeowners. Crazy appreciation is not good for homeowners after seeing three to four years of crazy appreciation because at some point when you have, you know, year over year crazy numbers, it's going to break something. You need some normalizing. You need some flattening in numbers and uh, allow things to breathe uh, in order to get back to that long-term trend that we've talked about. So, Josh, forget the reverse housing crash part of this. Um Housing prices, based on conversations that we've had with the four people that we've just talked about, seem to be, yeah, I don't know, there's not an average here, but I would say that the numbers have been discussed three to five, six, seven percent uh, appreciation in into 2024, uh, but just based off where things are at the moment. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summation of what they've come up with. And not just they're not pulling these numbers out of thin air. Listen to the episodes. They have data that has led them to this. They have done the numbers. They got a calculator. They did the math and went through it. And this is what it's telling them. Doesn't mean they're right, but it is an educated, informed, calculated number that they've they've come up with. And I'll, I'll go so far as to say, Jeb, I anyone wishing for a housing crash, that is not a homeowner, I get it. So you're saying, will this be good for homeowners? I don't think there's a homeowner in the world who's saying, you know what I would like if my home were worth less next year. That being said, I want a healthy housing market. So that means entry-level buyers being able to come in and get on that, that housing ladder and work their way up. So when we look at, you know, Logan kind of sidestepped the question. So we can, you and I can kind of discuss it here in the context of this question. He said, based off of demographics, economics, all of his numbers, he had a model that between 2020 and 2025, he thought we were going to see strong growth. And he said, as long as in the first four years of that window, we didn't see above and beyond 25% appreciation, we would have a good five to six year run based off of demographics primarily. Well, what did we get? We got COVID ultra low rates. And we got in most areas close to 40% when he was saying we needed to stay under about 25%. So that's not healthy. So when we talk about everyone's wanting mean reversion, well, you go, you go clapper again, turn your lights off. Dude, I don't know what's going on here, but your anyway, office is you. haunted. Your office is haunted. So when we, when we look at that and say, it would be good if we saw several years of 0% appreciation, at least in real terms. So not just out and out uh, appreciation, but if we have inflation at two and a half, three percent 3%, if homes go up two and a half, three percent 3% while wages are increasing, rates are moderating, it would go a long ways towards helping a lot of those disenfranchised people who think about this. Like if you, if you can't see this from the perspective of people who are on the outside looking in and can't get in, when you know that, hey, my buddy who's four years older than me was just at a different point in his life, we have the same degree, same job, same life, live in the same area, and he bought a house with a 3% mortgage for 40% less than I would have to buy, and I don't, it's not even an option for me. That would be very frustrating. We need that to normalize so that people can get in and, and have property work for them for all the reasons that we talk about homeownership being beneficial to people's economic well-being. No, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Mina came in with a $5 super chat. So thank you, Mina, for the the, the gift, if you will. Um, Mina asked a question, said closing on new construction in May of 2024, debating whether to sell my condo or rent it out. What factor should I be considering to make a decision? Have I, I have heard landlord tenant horror stories. So I would say worry less about the, the tenant landlord horror stories. Personally, they're always out there. You can find them anywhere you go. Um, if you're, if you're going to rent it, considering rent it, renting it, some things to consider first would be, what is it rent for? How much can you bring in off that property? What's your mortgage? Does that make sense? If that's, if the answer is yes, Hey, it's positive cash flow. I'm okay with it. Or if it's pretty close to positive, I'm good with it. Okay. That's step one. 
Secondly, do you need any money out of that property? Now, this probably should come before the renting it out part, but do you need money out of that property You know that, that, that would come from selling it? If the answer is no, great. Then you kind of proceed to that, that step of, of checking how much it would rent for. But once you have those and, and you determine, hey, it looks like the numbers are positive. That's something I want to consider. Then you, you, you have options, right? You can talk to um, property manager. What does a property manager charge to take care of it? That might be worth your time if you don't want to deal with the the horror stories. If if you know property managers range somewhere between six and ten percent in most areas of of the monthly rent, so you can kind of get an idea there of what they would charge to do it. Um, that's you know something you have to consider. Also, things to consider would be if you have a lot of equity tied up in that property and it was your primary. You know, once you have no longer lived in that property two of the last five years, you essentially give up your your capital gains exemption on that property. So any you know uh, capital gains that you or any equity that you gained in that property from owning it during your primary days are, are no longer tax free at that point. So that's something to consider. Um, Josh, I had something on the forefront of my mind and I completely forgot what I was going to say about um, let me out. let me throw in my two cents. It's brief and maybe that will come back to you. I believe in buying and never selling. My kids that I don't have, so my French bulldog, my nephew someday may consider selling the properties that I own. And the exception would be, we had a guest last spring, Michael Zuber wrote a book called One Rental at a Time. And he says, never under any circumstances do you have alligators. And an alligator is a property you have to feed every month. It does not pay for itself. So my advice here, Mina and Minaj, you're asking the same question here up. Uh, you have it rented out at cash flow. Should I keep it or sell it? It's for a million reasons that we've gone over on the show a thousand times, if it pays for itself, keep it and let the magic work for you. It's going to have leveraged depreciation. It's going to have tax benefits. It's going to create income over time. All of those things um, hold them unless you have to sell them. And why would someone have to sell? Jeb was the perfect example to buy the home that he needed for his family. <laughs> he had to do it. He wanted to keep it as a rental for all the reasons I just listed, but had to sell it to make that new home a reality. There you go. Um, and what I had on the forefront of my my brain there did not come back. So we're going to move along. But uh, <laughs> it evaporated it, as it comes back or if it comes back, Mina, I will uh, I'll jump back in and, and let you know my thoughts. So there was a second part here. Um, we got Kyle on here saying, what's up, fellas? So what's up, Kyle? Good to see Kyle you, back from the dead. Kyle, I hadn't even seen videos from Kyle in a while. He's back. He's back he's and he's back. making videos and he's getting after it. He just helped me. Kyle just helped me, so I'm I'm appreciative. Um, so C Johnson says, "What do you think about arbitration on the buyer's end?" So typically, I'm I'm assuming I'm answering the right question here. So typically, when you buy a home, um, part of the residential purchase agreement, at least here in the state of California, is there's an area where you uh, initial if you willing or if you're willing to arbitrate and or mediate uh, if something were to happen during the process versus going to court um, during that you know, that transaction, if something transpired during that transaction. Um, and so my, my personal belief is that yes, you should agree to arbitration. It's, it's less expensive, um, than going directly to court. It gives you an opportunity to sit down and try to, to come to an agreement, um, with the other side so that, you know, you don't have the, the cost of, of, you know, going in front of a judge and, and dealing with all that attorneys and all that good stuff. Um, but I would say, I mean, I don't know the percentage, but I know a lot of times, you know, even the arbitration process ends up leading to to a court case anyway. But I think it's 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 beneficial to you as a buyer to try to sit down and resolve it prior to that. Um, it'll save you time, save you money. Um, just my two cents. I'm not an attorney, but my two cents. So, um, Josh. Any well, let's go, let's go back up here because we got some 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 questions that we kind of skipped over here. Uh, well, well, here we have a couple of regulars with some comments right. and questions. Jay back saying you guys are still one of the best. We're only one of you. Have others that you like more than us, Jay? Wishing you happy holidays. If you celebrate, we absolutely celebrate. And doesn't matter what holiday you celebrate: Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, New Year's, whatever. We, we celebrate them all. all we celebrate them all. You have a holiday, we will celebrate. So just invite us and we will celebrate with you. So whatever you and your family celebrates, we hope that it is awesome for you. And we appreciate you guys being here and sharing the year with us and, and asking your questions. 
All right. Uh, David, uh, another regular here says, with inflation moderating, are wages showing any discernible slowing in wage growth? Clearly, prices aren't going to come back, but I feel like affordability won't improve until wages until wage until wages catch up to prices. So, what are your thoughts on that, Josh? David, if you haven't already, you probably did because you are a regular. You're one of our loyal followers here. Go um, to the Educated Homebuyer episode with Barry Habib. He goes through in there and shows how if prices go up 25 percent. Mortgage payments go up 25%. That doesn't mean you need 25% wage growth. Um, it's it's a five, 10 minute conversation. He does a better job of breaking it down than we will. You're not wrong in what you're thinking here. Um, the big move that we're going to see, Jeb has run the numbers. Jeb, you have a really good video on this of saying, hey, if you're hoping for a housing market crash, you should be hoping for an interest rate crash because interest rates dropping by 30% makes a much bigger difference than the home price dropping by a, a similar amount. Um, so look at that and, and see what you think. But in, in terms of it, there's really only three things that improve affordability. Wages will continue to go up. The wage growth is going to moderate as the economy slows. Uh, interest rates are going to moderate as the economy slows. Unfortunately, for all the reasons we've talked about, we're likely to, can see the, to see the housing market continue chugging along with annual home price appreciation. Yeah. And like I said, in, in talking to Stephen Thomas today, not that I was surprised um, by uh, his thoughts on on the housing market, but I was I, I was a little surprised um, just in, in the direction and in, in thinking that we can still get home price growth in an environment where affordability isn't improving significantly. Right. I mean, you're you're giving you're get, you're getting some improvement because rates are going down, but you're also going to be giving some of it up as home prices continue to rise a little bit. Right. So um, that that drop in rates is going to help more than that, you know, than the the, the little push up in prices is going to hurt you. But it, it's it's, you know, 15 percent of Californians. I mean, I guess, you know, like uh, Logan said, four million people decide to buy a house every year, regardless of, of the market conditions, whatever. So, you know, you're going to have, you know, at least so many buyers to begin with, but it's just, it's one of those things. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting nonetheless. Uh, Josh, why do sellers prefer buyers who waive inspections? If a lot of buyers using VA or FHA will want an inspection anyway. So we've talked about this one probably a million times. What does a seller want? They want the highest net and they want the greatest certainty of close. So with this, there's some misconceptions around both FHA and VA that there's costs that they have to pay that they wouldn't have to pay for a conventional or a cash buyer. There's misconceptions that there are stricter property requirements, that they're going to have to do repairs, upgrades. Uh, and there's also a belief that this borrower is less well qualified and less likely to close. If anything, both FHA and VA are far more flexible than conventional or jumbo financing and more likely to close. But Jeb, from an agent's perspective that represents sellers, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, it's price always comes first, always. Um, but what I will say is occasionally sellers will look beyond price um, when you have comparable offers and decide to go a different direction because uh, something may be more favorable in a contract. Um, things like waiving inspections, waiving appraisals, waiving any contingencies are are less opportunities for a buyer to back out. So in my experience as a real estate agent, almost 20 years in the business, you know, there's typically two reasons that people back out of contracts. One is inspections and the other is the loan, right? It's one of those two things. Now appraisal comes in occasionally, but more often than not properties appraise. Um, so appraisal is rarely an issue. Even during the craziness of 2021, 2022, I don't think I had an, a property not appraised. Um, I mean, so appraisal is rarely the issue. So it's either somebody doesn't qualify for a loan or something comes up in an inspection. So if I come, if I'm looking at buyers and I've got a buyer that says, Hey, I'm willing to waive the loan and waive the inspection. I'm like, Oh, to my client, I'm saying, Hey, this looks like a, maybe a little stronger offer because these are the biggest hurdles that would typically keep a buyer from moving forward. They're, they're gone. How did that that stacks up better against this person when you got similar offers? So that's why people do that sort of thing. Um, doesn't mean you should do it. You know, I, I don't think you should ever waive an inspection personally. 
Uh, but that's just me. So, you know, you got to do what's right for you. But there's other things you can do to make your offer stand out in competitive situations. Um, and there's other things you can do, you know, like have your lender help out, you know, communicate. There's different things you can do to help stand out. And, and you you really need it all. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Ah, uh, let's see what we got here, Josh. You know, we have a question very close to what we just ask. Um, Let's throw this out because we had this conversation. And yeah. again, so listen, listen to the podcast because we went through this. The biggest thing is people saying, why would sellers sell their two, three or 4% loans and get another home at current rates? Jeb just did that. Yeah, I'll right tell you. 3% rate to a 7%. Here's the thing. A lot of people won't. A lot of people will keep that rate. Uh, but here's what I say. A majority. A uh, yeah, a lot of majority, but also there's a lot of people that bought during those times that didn't buy the right property. In fact, they bought a property they hate. They've been living in it for two years and it sucks because it's too small. It's not the style they wanted. It's in the wrong location. It's not in the school district they wanted. It backs to a street, It whatever. It just, it's not the right property for them forever. And so that's why people will sell it. Now me, I'm on the other side of that. I had the property that was in the good, the a great location offered everything I wanted except for a little bit more space. Um, and for me, that was the reason that I needed to, to, to make the move. I didn't want to, to, you know, sell, get rid of a property that had a 3% interest rate and go to a seven, which is now a six and a half percent interest rate, but it was the right move for me and my family. And looking back on it, I don't have any regrets. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, now for some people, they would have never done that. And that's okay. Like we, we almost didn't do it several times because we were having the same discussion that we're having today. But I think looking back on it, I've, I've thought about it multiple times and thought I, I haven't had a regret yet. And um, I, it, it was the right move for me at that time. That's why people will do it is because it's going to be something. It's a life event that's going to change. That's going to, make them need something different than they have right now. Bingo. Uh, let's see here. Josh, here's, was, here's yeah. Jeb. Here's one that comes up fairly regularly, but it's an easy one. Claudia currently building now expected to be done in March. Is there any chance for me to close on a lower interest rate? Like any hope right now, the bank wants me to lock in my rate at six and an eighth. So <clears throat> if you're not locked and rates move lower, you will get the lower rate. So six and an eighth is by no stretch of the imagination a bad rate if that's a conventional loan. If it's FHA, it's right in the ballpark of where it should be. Hopefully you're not paying any points. The builder's covering some of those costs for you to keep control of that transaction. Um, don't ever be pressured into locking, but realize if you don't lock and we give back some of the gains over the last few months, you could get a worse interest rate. So ask them what their policy is for a float down or the potential for a relock as you get closer to closing and then determine your risk tolerance and decide whether you want to lock it. They're just wanting to keep everyone on board and moving forward and thinking, hey, what if rates go back up to six and a half and they change their mind because they're mad they didn't get that six and an eighth? No, exactly. Um, Josh, I realized a problem. On Instagram, if anybody puts a question in, we can't respond can't, to it. You can't see it. So, so are they asking questions over on Instagram? Uh, there were a couple earlier, and I just kind of um, just now just noticing it, that it I takes did. more than a fourteen second TikTok view to fire off a question, though. So they must actually be watching. You know, yeah. Anyway, we'll have to uh, we'll have to come back to that. Jeff, this um, was a phrase is a question, but I would like you to answer this. Christina, okay. who's here regularly, says outbid recently. Come to find out, they chose an offer with a lesser amount. Why? How? Don't they have to go with the highest offer? No, that's that's the thing. Um, they don't. Uh, seller can choose whatever they want, uh, and it can be it can be less desirable terms if if they so choose. But what I would guess is typically what happens when it could be it could be a number of things. Um, but if if a seller ends up accepting an offer for a lesser amount, it might be that yeah, it was a lesser amount, but maybe the buyer was putting more money down or maybe they were waiving one of those contingencies like, you know, the the person mentioned a moment ago asking why somebody would do that. Uh, maybe, um, what else could it be, Josh? Um, it, it, I mean, yeah. Uh, the big uh, one. Maybe, maybe they Josh, were giving free rent back, uh, you know, to, to the seller. They were more favorable terms in some way that the seller thought, 
this is a better offer for me to take versus something else. And it could also be, don't want to go this direction, but you know, maybe the agent is representing that buyer if they're in a state where they can do that. And they ended up going that way for that reason. And there's some sort of, uh, you know, change in compensation from the agent to make it more enticing. You know, there's a lot of things that could be going on there. So hard to know without knowing all the details. Wouldn't you say, Jeb, if we put broad categories, maximum net, so you're saying a lower offer, but there are things like a rent back that can mean it netted them more. Yep. Um, speed, how quickly it can get closed, and certainty, yes. the likelihood of it closing. Would you say those are the three big things the seller's looking for? Yeah. And like it depends. Like if you haven't, and this is going to be like one of those reasons that you can't do home buyer letter type stuff anymore, but you know, I have older clients occasionally that just want like a good family. They want good people, like, cause that's where they raise their family. And, and like, so there can be a number of things going on in a transaction that just like, and, and sometimes you don't even know. Um, but I would say that, yeah, what you said is, is accurate 90% of the time, 95%. So what you're saying the is there's sellers out there that are against single people and childless people. So if my wife and I went out for, uh, offers, they would look and say, you have no children. We don't want you in our home. You just have to show them show them the 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 fur dog and uh, the fur pictures, baby pictures of pictures of peanut and they would understand and then, you, and then you're back in it for most people right um Got but it. yeah i mean that's one reason that you know the buyer letters are a problem um let's see josh we're getting close to the end here it's five Claud claudia just paid for dinner brother claudia just paid for dinner that was before inflation josh that before was inflation uh, yeah at, at Joe's, I can get the late night menu and still have a nice dinner for $9.99, believe it or not. So I might I might be in. I might take the $9.99 and run to Joe's. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, too good. But thank you for the super chat. That's awesome, Claudia. You rock. Um, uh, did you... There's another one up here I, I want to make sure we get to. She asked it a little while ago. Abby Olajuwon hopefully has the dream shake Akeem. from Uncle, Uncle Akeem. Yeah. But... Uh, I have a home that I rent um, free and clear since my mortgage is at 2.37. So a little confusing there, but a mortgage at 2.375, you rent the property out looking to buy a different primary residence. Since my first home rate is so low, should I try to pay off the next home at 6%? Uh, without seeing the whole situation, we can't say definitively, but I would always look at paying off 6% debt prior to paying off a 2.37. And then on top of that, since you've owned that other home for longer, bought it at a lower price, you probably already have a nice equity cushion in there. So build up that equity in the new home, retire some of that higher interest rate debt. I think in general, with what we know from a distance here is, is a good plan. So you're absolutely on the right track. Good stuff. I, I agree with that. Like I've never, like, this is going to say never, like when I, my, my, when my rate was at 2.99, there was nothing in me that was like, Hey, I need to pay this off fast. Now I look at my mortgage and go, <laughs> I, I want, like, I, I, I have a goal. Like I wrote it down that like, how fast can I pay this thing down? Like, can I pay this thing off in five years, 10 years? Like maybe that's, I think that's the goal. Like now that the rates higher, it's like, okay, this is, this is real money. That's, that's going to the interest. Like we need to get rid of this. But anyway, yeah. um, yeah, but quick Abby, question Abby you. said Did that was her, that's a, that's her dad. Oh, what? <laughs> No, it's not. She's pulling our leg. She heard me say I got excited that Steve Smith was in here, and she goes, I'm going to tell him Akeem Olajuwon's my dad. <laughs> but anyways, the, the bank of dad would probably be paying off all those mortgages. I, I would like I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with it and say that is Abby's dad. But anyways, like Jeb, we yes. got 207 viewers. We were wondering before the show came on how many viewers we would get, whether we hit the holidays, we hit a little bit of a lull here. So for those 207 people here wondering how, besides answering their questions, we can help. How can the show help them, Jeb? Uh, a couple things. Um, how can the show help them? Um, how can they help the show? Well, they can help the show by hitting the thumbs up if you're here on YouTube, um, subscribing uh, to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you haven't headed over and checked out the Educated Home Buyer podcast, do that YouTube channel. You know, it's on Spotify, Apple, all those good places to uh, to hear a lot of different content on becoming the educated home buyer. You know, just making yourself smarter, more educated. Um, if you need a lender, you know, if you're in the process, you're getting a loan, you want a second quote, or you're starting the process. Uh, there's a link scrolling at the script. Uh, actually, it's not going anywhere. It will now. Um, <laughs> now where it will. you can 
where you can uh, get in touch with Josh here if you're on the West Coast. And if not, I'll refer you to somebody that we know, like, and trust across the nation. Uh, and the same thing for real estate agents. If you're here locally looking to buy or sell a property in uh, 2024, if you want some guidance, I would love that opportunity. You can get in touch with me by using that referral link. And if you're somewhere else, I can refer you to somebody that does business like I do. Um, so Josh, it's what? It's, it's almost our hour. It's almost come to an end here. Um, really important question. Chick-fil-A or raising canes? The answer is I don't I really think a, I don't think there's I, I think this is a really easy question. Both? Is the answer is both? Yes. Chick the answer is Chick yes. Chick-fil-A is significantly better than raising canes. Raising oh, canes no, is good. No. It's no, good. No, they're both Chick-fil-A is different. significantly just different. better. No, no, yes, equally absolutely. delicious. Equally delicious, Jeb. The fries at Cane's are a thousand times better than those waffle things that you can't even fit in the little tiny sauce cup. Oh, like, dude, amazing. And here's the thing. Crazy, crazy that we're even having this discussion earlier at a doctor's appointment with my wife. And for all of you guys and girls, I feel like I have to say that now for everybody in here um, that mentioned, you know, thoughts to my wife and, and glad she's doing OK and all of that earlier. I appreciate all of the well wishes. It means a lot, guys. Uh, but anyway, I was scrolling through what Google thinks I want to know. Um, and it, I read an article about how in New York, uh, they might require Chick-fil-A to be open on some locations to be open on Sunday because uh, it's on, it's on live in a, because it's we on, live in a dumb world. Yeah. Because it's on thoroughfares where if people want to stop and, and get food and it might be the only place open and, and they can't get anything. So it's a therefore business, they, a they've got to change service. their philosophy so that people that you know, my chicken is might not be a hungry. utility. You can get chicken any place. You can go down. And on that topic, Jeff, we have a good continuation of the conversation. Me, not me, but me popped up and said Popeyes. And then I've never had Popeyes here. So Kim pops up and says Popeyes too can dine for 1099. I have never had Popeyes. There are people I, who swear by Popeyes. There's one over on Beach Boulevard. Never had a Popeyes, but I heard that it's good. There, There's like this whole chicken sandwich challenge thing. I told my wife, you know, a year or so ago, I wanted to do it. It's like where you take, you know, Raising Cane's, Chick-fil-A, uh, Popeye's, you, you taste them all and like a taste test. I just, I, I, let's, I don't let's know do that. Let's, Chick -fil -A. let's have, let's have a Christmas party. Each one of us will run and get a different chicken and we'll bring it back and everyone will have it. Jeb, I'm really hungry we, right now. We actually, as fun as this is, talking about chicken uh, right before dinner time. There's a really good question here. I like it. Okay. It's unique. Let's let's we're gonna end with this. Shadow yes. Rich Builder is offering a fifty-eight thousand dollar incentive on a million dollar home. Five point eight percent discount. The rate uh -huh. is seven and a quarter. I could do a VA loan at five point eight five with no incentive. Seven and a quarter rate seems insane. Here is the craziest part. You will not have a prepayment penalty with that loan. So calculate the difference between seven and a quarter and 5.85 for six months. Watch rates slide down over the next six months. Refinance into your VA at five and a half at that time and have your cake and eat it too. There you go. Speaking of eating. Uh, but anyway, guys, uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, it's six o'clock. We are going to going to go spend some time with with family. Um, it's the holiday season. Uh, with that, we appreciate you guys being here. Um, you know, appreciate all the support throughout the year. We'll we'll be back next week. One more episode uh, for the end of the year. Um, but did want to say we're grateful for you. Um, but with that, if you haven't done so, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Josh, any parting words? No, other than that, Hi, Christina. Christina's star starving. And isn't she in Georgia? Where no, she's Louisiana. Somewhere Louisiana. I knew somewhere in the South. It's way late in Louisiana. You should have eaten long ago, whether it was Popeye's, Chick-fil-A. She's baking bread, dude. She's like a bread, like a, like a bread maker now. Is that a, is that a All word? Right. Bread maker? She's, she's a bread maker. She's making, making bread. Dude, all she does, she posts, like she says she's starving. And then I, I look at her feed and all I see is bread and then I'm starving. So I think this is like paint, like she's like trying to push it back on me. Anyway, sourdough girl. Jeb, there you go. Jeb, we have multiple Merry Christmases here, and it didn't even dawn on me that we're not going to see you folks before Christmas. So Merry Christmas, Happy uh, Hanukkah, yes. Happy Kwanzaa. Anything, are there any other holidays celebrated in the month besides New Year's? We'll be back before New Year's, but all of the other holidays that are coming up in the next week, I hope you have awesome ones. There you go, guys. Until next week, adios. Amigos.